right behind Heinze School, okay. which I attended. Mm -hmm. And um, typical, you know, boy living in St. George's, um, spent a lot of days fishing on the carnage, going up to the fort, the esplanade, running through the tunnel, mm -hmm. doing things like that. Um, I went to, strangely enough, I went to two primary schools, you know, most people go to one. Right. But I went to IZ school and then my parents traveled to England, I went away to live in England for a while. Okay. And when I came back, I went to Wesley Hall School, mm -hmm. and I'm a Methodist, so I should have gone to that one first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> then I went to GBSS, and um, again, I left GBSS and went to live in the United States. Okay. Then came back and went to GBSS again. Mm -hmm. So I went to GBSS twice. <laughs> so I have two sets of friends I went through with two sets of masters that taught me. Mm -hmm. So when people meet me in town and say, hi Roger, we went to school together. I have to stop them and say, when, where, which? Right. Roger, one of the most interesting things about you is that you are one of the few um, Grenadians who served in the Vietnam War. But my question to you is, what in God's name <laughs> would make a Grenadian during the height of the Vietnam War, when, I, when you joined, what would make a Grenadian join the U.S. Army at that time um, during what was considered to be a very unpopular war? What, during that time, there, there was a lot of um, social unrest, there was a lot of anti-war sentiments, um, a lot of cr cries and calls for Johnson to stop the war. A lot of American boys coming home in, 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 in um, bags, in, in body bags. Why and what inspired you? What, what, what made you want to join the Army at that time? Well, Eugene, it's a good question in retrospect. Everything you say in there is true. Mm -hmm. When you're 18 years old, when you're somebody like me, I was always attracted to the military. Mm -hmm. Anytime the British warships came to visit, I'd be running down to go on board. I, I loved the uniforms. My friends, Georgie and Champy Evans, or Ian Seminard, Psycho, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we always went to see the ships. Um, it's a strange thing in my personality, and the people who grew up with me were not surprised. Uh, my buddies and my close friends, when they heard I was in Vietnam, they weren't surprised. Mm -hmm. Because there was something in my nature, I was attracted to, to activities like that. I remember the Tet Offensive in 1968, right. when the U.S. Army was bogged down at Hue, the Hue Citadel in Vietnam. That sort of attracted me. It may sound strange. Mm -hmm. So on a visit to Puerto Rico at the time, my mother was married a second time, my stepfather, who I call Uncle N fondly, was an American himself mm -hmm. and a World War II veteran. Okay. We were on holiday in Puerto Rico for a couple of days and I said, Uncle Len, you know, I really want to join the army. He said, Roger, are you serious? I said, yes, this is what I want to do. He said, well, if you're serious, we'll do it. I joined the army right there, 18 and a half years old, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. My parents hugged me and kissed me goodbye and gave me $5 to hold in my pocket, and I was on my way. You know, I read your book, Tattooed Memories, and there's an interesting story about that when you joined. Um, you're about what, six feet tall, yeah. but you also had to meet a, a weight requirement, weight just, yeah. and um, you didn't quite make it. Yes. What, what happened there? Well, How actually, did you get through? You actually it's, almost didn't get your dream. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. I was always a very slim guy. Mm -hmm. Some would call it skinny. Mm -hmm. So um, when everything in the military is done by purpose, so for a certain height, you have to be a certain weight. So my parents have gone back to Grenada. I'm left in Puerto Rico with $5 in my pocket, and I'm going through the signing up process, and a guy says to me, I'm sorry, you're disqualified because you're two pounds underweight. So I said, well, so what am I going to do? My parents have gone back. I mean, I don't have any money or anywhere to stay. He says, go down to the water cooler and drink as much water as you can and come back. <laughs> At first, I thought the guy was kidding, but he was serious. I said, are you serious? He said, yes, that's all I can tell you. You put on some weight, huh? You <laughs> I went down to the water cooler, and I drank until I felt I was drunk. <laughs> I started back up to the thing, and I go on the scale, and I made the two pounds. Yeah. He said, OK, you're in. You're in. <laughs> <laughs> but I, well, you got in there. It's a got great, great way to get yeah. in there. <laughs> and that's a true story. Mm -hmm. it sounds like fiction. Mm -hmm. It's a fact. You know, That's how I got in. And so you're in the US Army now. 
and um, the Vietnam War is on. And um, how long did it take you after you joined? I guess you would have done basic training and all that. Yeah. And then, well, how long after did you end up in Vietnam? Well, there's a process. Mm -hmm. process. Everybody does basic training mm -hmm. for uh, eight weeks to ten weeks, mm -hmm. where you learn to shoot and do everything that a soldier does. Mm -hmm. So that's when you become a soldier after you go to basic training. Right. So after basic training now, you have to do what you do in the army. Are you going to be a cook, a truck driver, an infantryman, a medic or what? Right. Um, I had pretty high scores at the time and I went through basic training. Mm -hmm. I was one of the three guys in a company of 100 men that maxed the basic training. Mm -hmm. Shooting, mm -hmm. PT, everything. So we all given a little one strike promotion. Right, right. And then the company commander said, well, what do you want to do? And I didn't plan it. But I looked at the medic, something inside of me, I don't know, because I have family who are doctors too, so Morris Bayer. And um, I said, I'll try the medical training to be a medic. Um, but of course, a medic is a, a wide range thing. You could be working in a hospital. You don't have to be necessarily a combat medic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But because, um, so after my 10 weeks, I went to what they call AIT, Advanced Individual Training, and I spent three months there learning to be a medic, doing everything, helicopter, intravenous, giving shots, everything, you know, the words, almost like being a nurse. And then, not too long after that, it was a year after I joined. I joined in November 1968. In November 1969, I got orders for Vietnam, to go to Vietnam. And one year later? One year later. That's wow. at the height of the Vietnam War. Right. I was on my way. To but Vietnam. Eugene, I was a soldier. I joined. Soldiers fight wars. That's what we do. So that's what you wanted yeah, to do? That's what I wanted to do. And so you would not have been happy to be a hospital medic, for example, to be I would have hated You it. wanted to be I wanted on the front to be lines. In a helicopter, mm -hmm. going out into the field, and you know, that's what you know. Let me ask you all these years later, looking back at it, would you choose the same path? Um, I think this is who I was. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we could sit down here and I, I, sometimes I look back, you know, Eugene, the problems I have in life today, I say, Roger, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. You're talking about traffic no, and stuff like that? Remember what you went through? Mm -hmm. Remember mm -hmm. what you were responsible for? Mm -hmm. But it's a different time and I can tell you, when I was doing research to write my first book, Tattooed Memories, mm -hmm. the story of Vietnam, if I didn't have photographs and citations and letters from people, I would not have believed it myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and I suppose this is what human beings forget or you move on. But when I think back of the things I did and what I went through, I have to shake my head too. All right. Know, Tell us about the Vietnam War. Um, I guess you know, the, the viewers and listeners. What was the war about? Who was fighting? What were they fighting for? All right, you, you had um, Vietnam, you had North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. North Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh was communist. Mm -hmm. South Vietnam was a friend of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. United States didn't want the whole of Vietnam to go communist. Mm -hmm. So this is what was happening then, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cold the War. Western mm -hmm. powers, the Cold War, mm -hmm. you're trying, you know. Mm -hmm. So the United States, in supporting South Vietnam, sent in advisors to advise the military to help them uh, keep the North, the communists out of the South and so. Mm -hmm. But the advisors became troops and troops and troops. And when I got there, there was half a million American soldiers on the ground. Mm -hmm. It just built up. Mm -hmm. So then advisors became full fighting units, mm -hmm. right? So the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong came down from the North and we in the South but the war took place in the south. Where right. We, yeah, it right. wasn't in the north. And it was a kind of guerrilla style war. Guerrilla war. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I belong to an infantry combat unit, mm -hmm. helicopter first air cavalry division. They helicopter my unit out to the field, and we spent three months patrolling. And what you are actually doing is what you call search and destroy. You're mm -hmm. looking for the enemy to engage them, mm -hmm. to defeat them. Mm -hmm. So we lived out in the jungle for periods of maybe like three months and then we come back in for a week and then go back out. So I was actually an infantry line unit medic, combat medic in the field. What exactly does the combat, combat medic do? Okay. The war? What right. we did, mm -hmm. um, you have, my company has 100 men. Mm -hmm separated into four squads of 25 uh, platoons each. Mm -hmm. 
Each platoon has a medic and then there's a headquarters medic. The medic, our job ranges from making sure the guys drink the mal malaria pills every morning. Right, right. <laughs> because some fellas stop drinking the pills so they could get sick so they could go home. back in. <laughs> so every morning the medic would go wrong and I say, Eugene, take your pill. Right, right. And I right. stand up and watch you take it. Make sure I, I take it, right? right. <laughs> then, obviously, when we had action, mm -hmm. we had to bandage, save lives, call in a helicopter, put the wounded in the helicopter. And I could tell you, the medics, I'm in touch with my company commander up to today mm -hmm. on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We are still fast friends. The medics were some of the highest respected uh, people in a combat unit. I would think, yeah. There was a time when we had to go to the field and we were short two medics and the guys almost rebelled. They said they're not going out without the medics mm -hmm. because we were the first line to save their lives. Mm -hmm. not but you, you, but you, had, you had to try to save their lives but also try to save your life as yeah, well, right? But, yes, because you're a soldier first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I carried an M16 mm -hmm. rifle with a 30 round clip mm -hmm. because I was a soldier first. Mm -hmm. My medic was, uh, I was a soldier doing a medic job. Right. So we, we had combat, but of course uh, our unit going up a hill, the point man would get hit, we walk into an ambush, a bunker complex, and the yell would come out, medic! Mm -hmm. And I had to move up there to save the guy's life without mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. I just had to find my way up there under fire. Right. Hence, I have a Purple Heart and a couple other awards. And again, don't, don't say that so lightly because the Purple Heart is the <laughs> yeah. highest award yeah. one can get in the, in the well, US Army. Actually, Isn't it equivalent to the Victorian Cross? No, 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 not really. It's, actually, no. no. People, the, the, the Purple Heart is for wounds received in combat. And I got a nick on my waist, a wound, so I received the Purple Heart for that. Uh -huh. But the Purple Heart is awarded to people who are in combat. Ah. So if you get hurt or something, you can't get a Purple Heart for being back in the rear or something. It's awarded for people in combat. I see. And obviously, in most cases, the person is engaged in combat when they get the Purple Heart. I see. But it's not the Congressional Medal of Honor or the highest medal. I see. I have the Army Commendation Medal with the V device and all that, which is higher than the Purple Heart. Got you. But people always like to hear about the Purple Heart. Purple Heart, heart. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's an amorous award. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I, I. No, you know, in your book, Tattooed Memories, you talk about the noise of, of war, the noise of battle, the battlefield. Expound on it a bit more. It's something that um, I'm glad that's a, that's a really interesting question you raise. Um, when you're in the jungle, it's very quiet and you have to speak in whispers because sound yeah. carries. Right, and the enemy so, might hear you. Yeah, we can't speak mm -hmm. like how oh, you and I mm -hmm. speak. No, I like to say, Huge, so and so. No, so it. you're living mm. that way, mm. speaking in whispers. All of a sudden, you walk into a bunker complex where the enemy opens up on you with an M60 machine gun or something. Automatic weapons opening up rocket grenades and hand grenades. So you go from whispering to your eardrums being just totally routed out with noise. Mm -hmm. And the noise and the confusion, as I described in the book, you feel as though you're walking in quicksand or you're moving in slow motion, like you're in a daze because of the noise. I always remember the noise, you the know. Noise. Maybe people remember that aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always remember the noise of it, mm -hmm. you know. Interesting. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. It's finally here. The long-awaited historical drama, Julian Fedon, is finally here. One man with a sense of destiny. 14,000 slaves with a dream and a promise. Tonight we stand our ground. Tonight we stand on the side of history. Julian Fedon, presented by Heritage Theatre Company, in conjunction with the Grenada Broadcasting Network, the Grenada Cooperative Bank, the Grenada National Lotteries Authority, opening Saturday, 12 February, 7 p.m. at the Trade Center and continuing. Experience the conflict. Close down their churches, every one of them. Feel the passion. The epic drama of a people caught up in a desperate struggle for freedom. Seems to me like you are trying to get yourself killed. Julian Fedon, bring out the entire family and enjoy an experience in Grenadian theater. Get ready for a season of Grooving Smooth and Live on GBN. Moving Smooth and Live is a one-hour performance gig every Thursday from 8 p.m. 
featuring performances from our local musicians and short interviews discussing all things musical. Every Thursday, a different musician and a different instrument will be featured. From the violin to the saxophone, to the trumpet, guitar and steel pan, our local musicians playing, improvising and educating us on all genres of music. Join GBN with host musicians Matthias and Shireen and a special guest every Thursday at 8 p.m. It's Grooving Smooth and Live on GBN. When you need your prescription filled or you require non-prescribed medication, supplements, or all your personal needs, visit Gittins Healthcare at locations on Wall Street Grand Dance, Victoria Street Grand Dance, and Central Deputy Street Wall. Gittins Healthcare aims to provide an exceptional personalized pharmacy experience. Additionally, children under 5 and adults 55 years and over will enjoy 10% discount on purchases of $20 and over on prescription medication. Stop selling and for less, visit Kittens Healthcare, where your health is our priority. level of convenience and comfort awaits you when you shop at Rise and Shine Supermarket and Hardware Supplies, Griffin Lane, Grenville. Convenient, because we are open Sunday to Sunday. We're even at your service on public holidays. Comfort, because we are easily accessible to the physically challenged. Free Wi-Fi is available while you shop, and bags come at no charge. Everyday low prices and excellent customer care. Adequate parking available. We supply everything you can possibly think of. Family and home supplies, fresh meat, vegetables, and personal care products. All brands of cooking gas at affordable prices. You can send in your order, have it pulled, or pick up express. Get away from your daily stress with a Grenada vacation at the Koyaba Beach Resort. Koyaba is located on the world famous Granans Beach and boasts five and a half acres of beautiful garden. We offer excellent service, good food and drink, well appointed rooms and friendly staff in a safe environment. include two restaurants, two bars, swimming pool, water sports, tennis, gym and body treatment rooms. Call 473-444-4129. Welcome back viewers and listeners. So Roger, after your military service and Vietnam, where did you go from there? Well, I took advantage, Eugene, of uh, something they call the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. um, people heard the word GI and they refer to an American soldier as a GI. Where that came from is government issue. Mm -hmm. Everything the military issues, whether it's your socks, your shoes, or your pants, is GI, government right. issue. So we were GIs. Right. But they had a program to help veterans, uh, soldiers, after they left the military, where they would help you with education and to, to learn a new skill and they actually pay 90% of your tuition. So I took full advantage of that and went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Florida, top flying school in America, mm -hmm. and got my commercial license, multi-engine and instrument rating. Mm -hmm. So I came back home uh, as a commercial pilot. Right, and, uh, and I understood that you, you, you worked with two, but I remember you from Liat, you yeah, worked with Liat, yeah. flying us around. Right. And then, but um, I think before that you worked with Tropical Air, I, flying I celebrities with, yeah, around. Yeah, I, I worked with Tropic, Tropic Air, first mm -hmm. Tropical Air Services, and that's really interesting too. Mm -hmm. We flew celebrities. Mm -hmm. People came into Barbados and they went to Mustique, maybe, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. island in the Grenadines. Mm -hmm. And um, I flew Mick Jagger, Elton mm -hmm. John, Princess nice. Margaret, all of them, you know, mm -hmm. Mick Jagger's my old buddy. Okay. Um, <laughs> and um, nice. we flew the celebrities mm -hmm. back and forth. That was great. Uh, another experience, which I'm going to address in print. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't good, worry. Good, good, That's to come. Mm -hmm. And then I joined Liat. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent two and a half years with Liat, first based in Antigua and then in Barbados. So I was a regular Liat pilot, flying mm -hmm. up and down. And then, and then the opportunity. Then the then, story. Then the story, right? This you may sound like fiction again. 
<laughs> but I have to tell you, Eugene, mm -hmm. one day I was flying, I was doing a flight from San Lucia to Barbados, this is Liat, mm -hmm. and Morris Bishop and his party came on board. No, mm -hmm. I know Morris from way back mm -hmm. when, family ties, friends in Grenada and so, mm -hmm. always a bit older than me and mm -hmm. we didn't hang in the same group, I knew Morris. Right. I was part of the demonstrations in 73, the Jewel Boys and so right. So we had a thing we did in Liat and uh, being professional. You invite somebody sometimes up to the Cop, jump seat. Cockpit, right. We have a jump seat mm -hmm. if you want to ride. Mm -hmm. So I told the flight attendant, I said, that's Prime Minister Bishop. Tell him, Roger, ask if he wants to come up. So next thing, Bishop comes up and he sits down in the next jump year, seat. Mm -hmm. and the captain is saying, that's Morris Bishop. And mm -hmm. I said, hey, Roger, all things, boys, so and so. So we had a lovely flight, St. Lucia to Barbados. Mm -hmm. So Eugene, just mm -hmm. as we were getting into Barbados, Morris stood up from the jump seat and he says, well, thanks for the ride, but um, Roger, when are you coming back to fly my plane? So I laughed and the other pilot and said, fly your plane, I didn't know you had a plane. <laughs> he said, yes, um, I'll be getting one soon. Will you come back and fly it, um, if I get a plane? So I'm thinking I'm being smart. I said, sure, man, if you get a plane, I'll come back and fly. <laughs> Not realizing. About three weeks later, the phone ring. I'm in Barbados at my home, and I hear this deep voice. He said, Roger, I got the plane. When are you coming? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, I, I, I look as well committed myself. Um, I wanted to come back home to Raleigh, mm -hmm. flying with Liad for two and a half years, same plane, same route, up mm -hmm. and down passengers. Mm -hmm. And being the type of person I was, I was ready for another challenge. Mm -hmm. So this is how I ended up coming back home and being Morris Bishop's personal pilot. Amazing so story. He, he hold me. You he he catch you. He catch me. <laughs> yeah. Now what plane did he? What what type of plane did he have? The it was a Piper Cheyenne P thirty one T executive jet propeller and a luxury plane. So a six seater. Um, conference room. Eight tables, the works, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. As I say, it's a jet prop, mm -hmm. which means it is. It's a half a jet engine and um, a pipe of shine, a luxury airplane, a lovely mm. plane. And how far can that go? Um, well, we, we went to Cuba more than anywhere else, right. as you could imagine. Right. And it took us six and a half hours, okay. about four hours to Cuba and another two hours to Havana. You know, Cuba is a long mm -hmm. island, so mm -hmm. about six and a half. But um, A commercial airline would take, if it, and then direct the same route would take um, um, about what, twice? Maybe four, yeah. Less. No, four hours. They would take probably about four hours, just about three and a half to four. We took about six and a half. So oh, okay, yeah. okay. So as I said, it wasn't a pure jet engine. It was mm -hmm. a jet prop. I see. Meaning, you know. I see. But a high-class plane. And, mm -hmm. you know, we went to, um, from Grenada, you know, we went to Nicaragua, Suriname, Mexico City, um, mm -hmm. from Grenada, you know. So it, wow. it was adequate, you know, mm -hmm. really nice plane. But again, um, that was an entirely different part of my life flying that plane. Mm -hmm. I met Fidel Castro, mm -hmm. the Fidel right, Castro. Right, right. That is, is arguably one of the most interesting, well-known people in the world. Mm -hmm. I met Fidel right, Castro. Right, right, right. And I remember- Noriega? Uh, no, Daniel Ortega. Ortega, and, sorry. And, uh, Baltazar in Suriname. Mm -hmm. I have something in my house that Baltazar gave me. I met Daniel Ortega. But it's just a little part of meeting uh, Fidel Castro. When we went to Cuba from Grenada because of the security, we never knew exactly what airport we would be landing in in Cuba until we got there, they would tell us. Mm -hmm. And one morning at about 4 a.m., they directed us to a small strip on the outskirts of Havana called La Calota. And when we landed at La Colota, four o'clock in the morning, in a, a slight drizzle, Morris stepped out of our plane and Fidel Castro was standing up on, his, on the ramp with his entire cabinet to meet Morris Bishop. Wow. Our Morris wow. Bishop from Little Grenada. And I'll never forget that. Wow. Uh, that that's mm -hmm. how different that was. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll never forget that. And, and of course, I met Fidel and he spoke to me in Spanish, of course. Mm -hmm. so Hablo uh, Luckily, I have a little thing from GBSS. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I could understand what he was telling mm -hmm. me. So um, he, he came and he met all of us and shook our hands. We were lined up. And he turned, he was leaving, and he walked back to me, and he said to me, I, I hope you understand the importance of the role you play flying Morris Bishop. He told me that in Spanish. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I said, si, senor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And, um, yeah. So, Roger, after the revolution, and of course, the untimely death of Prime Minister Morris Bishop, um, how, 
how did the demise of the revolution hit you? Well, let me say, um, obviously, I worked for Morris Bishop. Mm -hmm. He was my boss and my friend. Mm -hmm. I came back to Grenada to work for him. Like a lot of Grenadians, uh, some people may think differently, he was the revolution. Of course. Remember, the two most popular politicians and leaders we ever had in Grenada was Eric Gary and Morris Bishop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They both had huge followings. Mm -hmm. And Uncle Gary had his people, mm -hmm. the same way people would do things because Uncle Gary was right. there. I believe the revolution lasted because of Morris Bishop. Right. So when uh, the terrible October 19th events occurred, mm -hmm. which obviously is one of the darkest days in Grenada's history, history. to a lot of us, mm -hmm. maybe not everybody, mm -hmm. Um, and Morris was murdered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. along with Eunice and Whiteman and others. I think that was the end. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe it could have been run in another way, but as far as I'm, it would be the end for me anyway. Right, I would right. not. You know. right. So um, then we have October 25th, <laughs> where the Americans invade Grenada. Mm -hmm. And in writing my book, Tattooed Memories, um, my very last chapter is called Full Circle where I described that the army I went to the war with in Vietnam a couple of years ago the US army. have invaded mm -hmm. my country, right? right? Mm -hmm. And to go further than that, um, they picked me up one day. They arrested tried, you? Yeah, arrested me mm -hmm. one day. I was in a shop, Batson's shop, taking a beer. They had some um, American soldiers in there. We were all having a chat. Mm -hmm. And then one guy came and whispered to another guy. And the guy turned to me and said, sorry, Mr. Bayer, but um, they have your name on a list of people who are you know, close and so on. We'll like Mr. Bayer, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll have to take you in. So mm -hmm. I said, it's all right. So he told them, he said, look, we're taking this man in, but no rough stuff, eh? Mm -hmm. So they took me down to Point Celine in a car. And I sat down there and interrogated me for a couple of minutes. I had nothing to hide, I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I was not political, I was a technocrat, I was a pilot and mm -hmm. did my job and everybody knows what happened. So I had nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. And then they let me go, but um, subsequently I got stopped two or three times on the road and because of my complexion, they thought I was a, a Cuban. Cuban. Mm -hmm. So they had me down on the road and so. Mm -hmm. So I solved that problem one day by saying, look, I tired of this thing, you know, being put on the hot pitch and so. I invited some soldiers up to my house. I went into my closet and pulled out my old army dress greens uniform with my six rows of medals from Vietnam. And I held it up and I said, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. So the fellow in charge of the unit, he made the six soldiers stand up and salute me. And he said, next time you leave your house, Mr. Bayer, walk with your jacket. So which I did. You never got stuck go again. Road, as soon as they slow down, I just hold my jacket out the window. That's it. <laughs> interesting. You had to use what you yeah, had. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And you know, the military yeah. respects fellow, course, fellow, yeah, you know. they respect each yeah. other. There's that, yeah. there's that um, respect well, among soldiers. Roger, you are now an author, yes. among other things. Right. And um, you've captured a lot of this in your book, Tattooed Memories. Uh, what about your more recent book, uh, Granny's? Granny's Bathroom. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what was, that's completely different yeah. from your oh, military entirely experience. different. Mm. And uh, you know, I just back up a bit. Mm. One of my people I went to school with, Alan Basinski, at the mm. launch of Tattooed Memories, he spoke. And he, he reminded everybody, he said that in Five Special, the last form I was in, GBSS, mm. I was a literary critic, me, Roger Barr. Um, you know, after we have the class, I will come and criticize mm -hmm. what people read and mm -hmm. so on. So I had forgotten that. Mm -hmm. Alan reminded me. So I'd always liked writing, even when I was in school. You know, mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. thought of myself as a writer or an author or anything like that. So having had my military career and my flying career, and I went into real estate afterwards, and so I had some time now to write. And I have to say here, um, fortunately for me, my wife never let me forget that I have to do some writing. So she kept at me. About your experiences. And mm -hmm. she is responsible for me, having put out my books, my wife. Great, woman, great. Fully responsible. If it wasn't for her, I'd probably up to now haven't written a line. Mm -hmm. But I sat down, we were in Barbados at the time, and she brought me an old computer, and she said, well, just start writing your books. So I said, well, I just can't start like that and anything. She said, well, think about it. Well, it must have been two days later, I got some old photo albums, some old letters and pictures, and I started looking at it. 
and you doing that to a night in today. I never stop after that. The writing, the things just came out of me, like I was a conduit. Things you were waiting to come out. Yeah, mm -hmm, they just mm -hmm. came out, came out, came out. So all those chapters and all the things that I wrote, I just transmitted it from inside of me. It was all there waiting to come out. Right, right, you know? right. And um, so I started with the tattooed memories, and again, not thinking, Eugene, you don't think of your life as some big glorious thing that you've done things people haven't done. You think of yourself as a normal person. Mm -hmm. But when I started writing, you know, even something like my parents leaving me five dollars in my pocket, drinking the water in the water cooler, and so all of those actually happened. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting story. A young boy leaving a Caribbean island, ending up in Vietnam and Cambodia, and coming back, and then going to flying school, and then being more suspicious pilot, and then flying and then meeting celebrities and so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's true. Mm -hmm. So it's not because it's Roger Bayer. If it was John Smith, it would be still an interesting story. Right. It, 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 yeah. it's, 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 it's a, a story, it's not yes. me. It's yes. a story. It's a fascinating yeah. story. It really is a and fascinating story. And for me, story. Um, mm -hmm. now that I'm writing, and uh, I just finished a, so a short story, and I have a concept that I'm very excited about to start to, now that I'm writing, it is probably the thing I like the most in everything I've done, okay, believe okay. it or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. More than being a soldier, more than being a pilot. I love writing. So you found your true calling. I think I found it, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Roger, thank you so much sure. for joining us today yes. and sharing your story with us. Yeah. It's a great story, right. and I'm glad we can share it with yeah. our um, Grenadians and everybody who will see this Thanks program. for having me too, Eugene, and I enjoyed the little session myself. Okay, okay. thanks, Roger. Right. Well, viewers, thanks for joining us for this first uh, program in this series. We hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.